Hey, ladies and gentlemen, Fisher coming at you. And uh, this is our first day doing To Kill a Mockingbird together virtually. Uh, we left off last chapter that we did. Technically, I didn't do it. Mr. Berger did it, but it was chapter 19. Y'all took a, an online assessment. I think it was 17 through 19. And now we're on chapter 20, which is probably one of the most important chapters in the entire book. Okay, so um, this will be the first assignment slash um, you know, reading that we're going to be doing with this book. Um, I'm only supposed to do two assignments a week. I'm supposed to post them twice a week. So I'm going to post them on Mondays and Wednesdays. And then open office hours will be every Friday from 9 to 11. If you need to get in contact with me or ask any questions. So getting to it. Chapter 20. Got 11 chapters left in this book. And I've made some notes. There's some very powerful stuff in this chapter. And I'm going to read quite a bit of it here. Probably the whole thing, honestly. So... Last thing that happened was uh, we were we were in the Tom Robinson trial. Atticus had been uh, defending Tom Robinson. And uh, then it was Mr. Gilmer, the prosecuting attorney's turn. He went up there and he was really mean to Tom Robinson, a black man who was on tra trial for raping a white girl. And uh, it made Dill really upset. So Scout took Dill outside and they happened to run into Mr. Dolphus Raymond, who is absolutely my favorite character in this entire story. You'll see why. He's the man who is from a wealthy family, good, good family because uh, generations of wealth, and he owns a lot of property, but he has a black wife and he has mixed children, and he seems to have a drinking problem, lots of whiskey. He drinks out of a paper sack all day long whenever he comes to town, and he kind of weaves around in his saddle a little bit. So why is that my favorite character? Because he's unique. He's interesting. But I'm not 100% sure what his motivations are, but we're going to get into those right now at the beginning of this chapter. So chapter 20, um, I'm on page 227 in our book. Obviously, if you don't have your book, you can just listen to me or you can find a PDF online. I cannot post a PDF on Google Classroom because apparently this book is still copyrighted. And so that is technically piracy for me to um, post a PDF. So I'm just going to go ahead and I'm not going to do that. So. Here we go. Chapter 20. Come on around here, son. I got something that'll settle your stomach. Mr. Dolphus, as Mr. Dolphus Raymond was an evil man, I accepted his invitation reluctantly. So Scout is the one that's talking right there. And she says that Mr. Dolphus Raymond is an evil man. And she believes him to be evil. She's making that assumption based on what people have said about him, based on his reputation. So those three things that I pointed out earlier, he has a black wife, he has mixed children, and he drinks too much whiskey. Those make him evil. Now, who is casting that aspersion, that making that judgment? The townspeople of Maycomb. And the mouthpiece for that in Scout's life is Aunt Alexandra. Remember that Scout's father, Atticus, is extremely open. He's a good man. He's pure. He, uh, he does the work that other people should be doing. But Aunt Alexandra is like what people were during this time period. A lot of people, she is a socialite. She's well-connected. She's well-liked. She's popular, but she's very racist. She's very elitist and she's fairly sexist. So there's a lot of uh, ists and isms that she um, believes in that make her, in my opinion, not a great person. But Scout is our narrator and she's been taught to respect her aunt and her aunt is saying that Dolphus Raymond is evil. So that's what she believes. Um, I followed Mr. Dolphus, I, or I followed Dill. Somehow I didn't think Atticus would like it if we became friendly with Mr. Raymond, and I knew Aunt Alexandra would not. Here, he said, offering Dill his paper sack with a straw in it. Take a good sip. It'll quieten you. Dill sucked on the straw, smiled, and pulled at length. He, <laughs> he said Mr. Raymond, evidently taking delight in corrupting a child. Now, what is supposed to be in that paper sack? Alcohol. Like, if you see people in society drinking out of a paper sack, that there's an assumption that there's alcohol in there. This is a paper sack with a straw in it, and he offers it to a child, Dill, and Dill takes a little sip, and whatever's in there, he enjoys it a lot. So he takes a good, strong pull of it. Uh, speaking of which, you know, it's important to stay hydrated during these troubling times which is why, once again, drink LaCroix, tangerine flavor. It's the best. Ah, that quietens me. Okay. 
Dill, you watch out now, I warned. Dill released the straw and grinned. Scout, it's nothing more than Coca-Cola. Mr. Raymond sat up against the tree trunk. He'd been lying on the grass. You little folks won't tell on me now, will you? It'd ruin my reputation if you did. So he has a reputation for drinking whiskey, and he's not drinking whiskey. He's actually drinking Coca-Cola out of that bag. This is strange. You mean all you drink out of that sack's Coca-Cola? Just plain Coca-Cola? Yes, ma'am, said Mr. Raymond. I, like, I liked his smell. It was of leather and horses and cottonseed. He wore the only English riding boots I'd ever seen. That's all I drink most of the time. Then you'll, you're just pretending you're half... Uh, I beg your pardon, sir. I caught myself. I, I didn't mean to be... Mr. Raymond chuckled, not at all offended. I tried to frame a discreet question. Why do you do like you do? What? Oh, you mean, why do I pretend? Well, it's very simple, he said. Some folks don't like the way I live. Now, I could say to hell with them. I don't care what they think. I do say I don't care what they think, right enough. But I don't say to hell with them. You see? Dill and I said, no, sir. I try to give them a reason, you see. It helps folks if they can latch on to a reason. When I come to town, which is seldom, if I weave a little and drink out of a sack, folks will say, oh, Dolphus Raymond's in the clutches of whiskey. That's why he won't change his ways. He can't help himself. That's why he lives the way he does. Well, that ain't honest, Mr. Raymond. Making yourself out battered than you are already. It ain't honest. But it's mighty helpful to folks. Secretly, Miss Finch, I'm not much of a drinker. But you see, they could never, never understand that I live like I do because that's the way I want to live. So I'm going to stop right there. there there's going to be more at the end that I'm going to read here. But this is one of the reasons that I like Dolphus Raymond so much. He is a uniquely interesting character. Now, he chooses to live his life the way he wants to live. He fell in love with a black woman. He has mixed race children, and he is completely okay with that. He's a very confident man, and, uh, and I like that about him. Now, the thing that's weird about him is that he tries to give people a reason to dislike him. Now, if it were me, or maybe you agree, maybe you don't here, I tend to stand up for what I believe in. I stand up to people, and I tell them what my thoughts are, and my feelings are, and I, I'm okay with people having their own opinions, much as Mr. Dolphus Raymond is, but he covers up the truth about himself to make fe people feel more comfortable with him. And I don't necessarily care if people feel more comfortable with me. So he's a good character. He's got a good heart and a good soul, but it's interesting that he's willing to sacrifice his own comfort for the comfort of other people. And I don't know if I'm, I don't think I'm that type of person. Although in some aspects of life, we all have to be that kind of person. All right. Now there's some conversation in here on page 229 about instincts and gut feelings and how as you get older, you start to become more used to some of the societal indiscretions like treating people who are different from you differently or looking down on certain people or um, feeling like say the poor people deserve to be poor because they don't work hard enough and some other things like that. And you still probably possibly feel in your heart of hearts that that's not a hundred percent true. Like if you really take a deep dive into your soul, you know that people who are working two and three jobs just to get by, it's not their fault. They're poor. Poverty is a sickness. It's a cage. Once you're in it, it's almost impossible to get out. Um, and people who are not in poverty have, had some luck or have worked hard or are, uh, you know, privileged or what have you. But just because you're a good person and you're rich or wealthy or whatever, doesn't make all poor people bad or lazy or not good people. Uh, those sweeping stereotypes like that, they're never true. There are no absolutes in life. Everything is in the gray area. There's no black, there's no white, everything's gray. Okay. So we're going to move on. Sonny, get out of here. Sorry, my cat's trying to get in the video. Sonny, go away. I'm trying to work. Man, you know, if I was at school, I'd have students distracting me. Now, I got cats distracting me. 
trashy cats too. Okay. So I'm going to fast forward here to page 230. And um, Atticus does something that's really out of character for him. He says, um, th they're back in the courtroom, okay? Dill's feeling better. He had some Coca-Cola, which during that time period, I think has cocaine in it. So I guess that would calm his nerves a little bit, maybe. Um, but Scout and Dill go back in. Their seats are still there. They're sitting there with Jim. And uh, Mr. Gilmer's done speaking. And it's now Atticus's turn to do his final thoughts or his final briefing on the trial. And um, Atticus paused and then he said something or he did something that he doesn't ordinarily do. He unhitched his watch and the chain and placed them on the table saying, with the court's permission. Um, Judge Taylor nodded and then Atticus did something I had never seen him do before or since in public or in private. He unbuttoned his vest, unbuttoned his collar, loosened his tie, and took off his coat. He never loosened a scrap of clothing until he undressed at bedtime. And to Jem and me, this was the equivalent of seeing him standing before us stark naked. We exchanged horrified glances. So Atticus is a very proper man. He's always wearing his shirt and tie, even at home. He's got a three-piece suit on. He's got a watch chain. He never takes any of it off except for when he sleeps. And he does that at night in his own bedroom, nobody else around. Okay. So we talked earlier in the year about the three masks that people have. We have the public mask, the private mask, the public one we show to everybody, like our school mask, our private mask we show to our friends. And then there's our, our private our personal mask that we never show to anybody else, our deepest secrets. And Atticus keeps a lot in that third mask. But we know that he is, his masks are all very positive, but he keeps a lot to himself. And right now, he's going to stop being the authority figure that's speaking down to people and trying to uh, educate them and make them understand what they should already know. And he's going to just talk with people. He's going to speak with the people in the jury like they are people standing on the corner just having a conversation. So he takes off all the clothes that they wouldn't normally be wearing, puts a thumb in his belt, and he just says this, Gentlemen, I shall be brief, but I would like to use my remaining time with you to remind you that this case is not a difficult one. It requires no minute sifting of complicated facts, but it does require you to be sure beyond all reasonable doubt as to the guilt of the defendant. To begin with, this case should never have come to trial. This case is as simple as black and white. And he doesn't mean extreme ends here. He means literally black people and white people. Okay? Sonny, I swear, if you don't get off my desk, I'm going to throw you out of this room right in front of this whole class. Okay. Sorry, I had to tough talk my cat for a minute. He is giving me the evil eye. This quarantine, man, I tell you, I think most pets are happy to have their uh, their families home. But cats, get off of my desk. Cats are getting fed up. They're rebelling. I think he might be plotting against me. You want to look at Can you see him just sitting there staring me down? Mm, it's a real struggle. Okay. Back to the lesson. If I suddenly have to stop. I will hit the pause button and then Sonny will disappear and he will never be mentioned again. Not like disappear, like, you know, mafia style disappear, but he'll just be out of the room in that door back there. So you hear that buddy stay off my desk. Leave me alone. Gosh. Okay. Back to this story. So Atticus is doing the closing argument. He's talking to the jurors and he's saying, this should never have been a case. There's no evidence. Nothing happened. And we all know it. The person who beat Nayella beat her with a hand that Tom Robinson doesn't even have. This is literally impossible. And to find somebody guilty of capital murder, you have to be positive that they did it beyond all shadows of doubt. There can be no doubt in your mind that they are guilty. And there's literally no possibility that Tom Robinson was at all guilty. So he's saying this is not possible and you must find him innocent. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit a couple of his actual words here during the speech. What was the evidence of her offense? Oh, I'm sorry. She was white and she tempted a Negro. She did something that in our society is unspeakable. 
she kissed a black man. Not an old uncle, but a strong young Negro man. No code mattered to her before she broke it, but it came crashing down on her afterwards. Her father saw it, and the defendant has testified as to his remarks. What did her father do? We don't know, but there's circumstantial evidence to indicate that Mael Ewell was beaten savagely by someone who led exclusively with his left. We do know in, do, do know in part what Mr. Ewell did. He did what any God-fearing, persevering, respectable white man would do under the circumstances. He swore out a warrant, no doubt signing it with his left hand. And Tom Robinson now sits before you, having taken the oath with the only good hand he possesses, his right hand. And so a quiet, respectable, humble Negro who had the unmitigated temerity to feel sorry for a white woman has had to put his word against two white peoples. I need not remind you of their appearance and conduct on the stand. You saw them for yourselves. The witnesses for the state, with the exception of the sheriff of Macomb County, have presented themselves to you gentlemen, to this court, in a cynical confidence that their testimony will not be doubted, confident that you gentlemen would go along with them on the assumption, the evil assumption, that all Negroes lie, that all Negroes are basically immoral beings, and that all Negroes are not to be trusted around our women, an assumption one associates with minds of their caliber. In other words, only stupid people believe that kind of crap, is what he's saying, but he says it so much more eloquently than I do. Which gentleman we know in, a, in itself is a lie, as black as Tom Robinson's skin. A lie I do not have to point out to you. You know the truth, and the truth is this. Some Negroes lie. Some Negroes are immoral. Some Negro men are not to be trusted around women, but black or white. But this is a truth that applies to the human race and to no particular race of men. There's not a person in this courtroom who has never told a lie, who has never done an immoral thing. And there is no man living who has never looked upon a woman without desire. Atticus paused and took out his handkerchief. Then he took off his glasses and wiped them. And we saw another first. He had never seemed to sweat. He was one of those men whose faces never perspired, but now it was shining tan. One, mo one more thing, gentlemen, before I quit. Thomas Jefferson once said that all men are created equal, a phrase that the Yankees and the distaff side of the executive branch in Washington are fond, are fond of, of hurling at us. There is a tendency in this year of grace, 1935, for certain people to use this phrase out of context to satisfy all conditions. The most ridiculous example I can think of is that the people who run public education promote the stupid and the idle along with the industrious because all men are created equal. Educators will gravely tell you the child left behind suffers terrible feelings of inferiority. We know all men are not created equal in the sense some people would have us believe. Some people are smarter than others. Some people have more opportunity because they're born with it. Some men make more money than others. Some ladies make better cakes than others. Some people are born gifted and the normal scope of mo beyond the normal scope of most men. But there is one way in, the, in this country in which all men are created equal. There's one human institution that makes a pauper the equal of a Rockefeller, the stupid man the equal of Einstein, and the ignorant man, the equal of any college president. That institution, gentlemen, is a court. It can be the Supreme Court of the United States or the humblest JP court in the land, or this honorable court in which you serve. Our courts have their faults, as do many human institutions. But in this country, our courts are the greatest levelers. In our courts, all men are truly created as equals. I'm no idealist to believe firmly in the integrity of our courts and in the jury system. That is no ideal to me. It is a living, working reality. Gentlemen, a court is no better than each man of you sitting before me on the jury. A court is only as sound, only as sound as the jury, and the jury is only as sound as the men that make it up. I am confident that you gentlemen will review without passion the evidence you've heard, come to a decision and restore this defendant to his family. In the name of God, do your duty. Atticus's voice had dropped. As he turned away from the jury, he said something that I did not catch. He said it more to himself than the court. I punched Jem and said, what did he say? In the name of God, believe me. I think that's what he said. Dill suddenly reached over and tugged at Jem. Look ye yonder. He followed his finger with a sinking heart. Calpurnia was making her way up the middle aisle walking straight towards Atticus.
and that is page 234, and that's where this chapter stops. Chapter 20, it's about assumptions, it's about reputations, it's about stereotypes, it's about equality and what equality actually should mean. Because in our society, we say that all men are created equal. And I use men as a non-gendered term here. All of humanity is equal. We use that in all sorts of court documents, in the founding documents of our country, right? Freedom of speech, freedom to bear, right to bear arms, freedom of press, all of those things are so important to us. And in those documents, we say all men are created equal. My question to you and your assignment That'll be this week's only assignment because we're starting school on Wednesday and I'm only posting one or two assignments per week, Mondays and Wednesdays. My assignment is to read this chapter, if you haven't done so already, or listen to this video again and decide what does equality mean to you? And does our country actually, literally, really, honestly, truthfully treat everyone equally? If so, how? And if not, why? That's a powerful question. I really want you to think about that. This goes along with all of my other self-reflection activities. I don't want you to believe something because I say it. I don't want you to believe something because your parents say it. I don't want you to believe something because you heard it or read it or saw it or or whatever, I want you to believe something because you truly believe it in your heart of hearts. If you find something you think you believe, I want you to research it. I want you to think about it. I want you to reflect on it. And once you've done all of those things, then I want you to take that to heart because we are what we think. We are what we do. We need to truly believe the things that we think about other people. All right? So does our society treat everyone equally? If so, how? And if not, why? That's my question. That's your assignment. All right. You guys, make sure you enjoy, enjoy a, a frosty LaCroix, okay? Tangerine flavor is the best. Wash your hands. Stay home. Be good. Practice social distancing. And exercise a little bit. Because uh, we need to, uh, well, we're trapped at home. We don't want to get, uh, you know, like unhealthy. We want to get prison fit. You know, maybe do some push-ups. I don't know, lift a bed. Whatever you got to do to work out. So that's all I got for you today, friends. This is the longest video I've ever posted, I think. 23 minutes. I'm going to shut up now.